So I guess we can probably get started with this one, our next panel of the day. It is about roles in InfoSec that don't require you to be an engineer. And Josh, come on back down. <laughs> I'm going to see my pregnant wife. That's probably a smart decision. Platonically, I hope, but. I think so. All right, yeah. so we can get right into this and how this panel is gonna work. I don't know exactly how Keith just ran his, but we'll see how this one works. So questions, I get a bunch of questions that I have for our esteemed panel here. Uh, hopefully we can't stump them too much or anything like that, but at the same time, if you have questions, that's gonna be awesome. So go ahead and think of questions. Uh, I moderated a panel last year and I think I asked people for questions. Uh, potentially to be asked at the end, but I had Josh on the panel and I had Andy Ellis from Akamai and those people just talked forever. So we kind of ran out of time, but we'll try to have time this year for audience questions uh, and see how that kind of goes. So who are the five of us up here? Well, just kind of really, did I misspell your last name, Rachel? It's okay, that's amazing. I, I'm gonna take a picture of that later. Let me, fi <laughs> let, let, let me fix that right now. No, it's really okay. <laughs> I'm going to change my name now. <laughs> but Platts is better. <laughs> as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, no. No, that's fine. I'm a last minute fill in, so. Hi, Mike. <laughs> OK, so we're back. So we have Rachel Spatz, also known as Platts, the demand manager at Cyber Reason. We have Jordan LaRose, who's a technical writer at Rapid7, Susan Kaufman, a principal senior security manager at Vericode, and Nick Castle, a client director at Optiv. And I am your friendly moderator, Patrick Laverty. So let's get right into the first question. Please introduce yourself, where you work, even though we just went over that, what you do, and a brief background. Nick, you want to start? Sure thing. So my name is Nick Castle. I'm a client director with Optiv Security. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Optiv, we are the nation's largest cybersecurity solutions integrator. Um, so I've been with the company for over 10 years and uh, have, have kind of started, you know, at the beginning as uh, doing renewals and working my way up through the, uh, the system. So um, prior to, to joining Optiv, this is my first job in InfoSec. Uh, I was in a completely different industry in food service. So I actually uh, managed a, uh, an Applebee's of all places for a couple years. So, um, and, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit of my background. So uh, I'm Jordan LaRose, I'm a tech writer at Rapid7. Um, I just recently joined up actually two months ago, uh, and this is also my first job in information security. Uh, beforehand, I was a tech writer at Electric Boat Building Submarines, so a bit of a change there, but I'm enjoying it so far. Hello, um, my name is Rachel Spatz, um, Platz. Uh, I am a demand generation uh, marketing manager at Cyber Reason, um, and this is my third job in cybersecurity. Um, I previously worked at uh, Core Security, did pen testing, vulnerability management, Katie Ledoux, um, and before that I worked at SSH Communication Security, which did encryption and um, user key management. Um, so I've been working in cybersecurity for about six years in marketing. Hi, I'm Susan Kaufman. I'm a program manager at Vericode. For those who don't know Vericode, we are a cloud-based solution for application security testing. Uh, this is not my first job in security. I've been at Vericode for three years. Uh, I was at EMC for 10 years before that, and most of my time at EMC was in security in some way. I worked in our corporate product security organization where we developed a secure development lifecycle process for all of our software products, and I also ran vulnerability management. Uh, and other than that, I've been in the world of software for more decades than I'd like to admit. There we go. And I actually ended up on ma moderating this kind of last minute. Um, and it's kind of interesting looking at the topic that you don't necessarily have to have an engineering background to get into info security. I actually have two degrees in sports medicine. That really has nothing to do with information security whatsoever. I, I grew up wanting to work in Major League Baseball. That was, that's what I was gonna do, so that's what I went to college to do. I went to Minor League Baseball, and those bus rides are terrible. 
So after about three years, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And believe it or not, where I got my start was right here in one of, maybe even this room. I, I can't really remember. Uh, I took some really terrible job at Harvard working for some person. And they have the extension school here, which is like one of the best deals ever. If you work at Harvard, you can take classes for like $40. And I just took a whole bunch of programming classes and then ended up teaching programming in places and moved on to information security. So I taught for Sun, teaching Java, moved on to a, a university teaching you know, the office products and some kind of things, became a web developer for a whole bunch of years. And then one day Akamai called me up and said, do you want to work on our blue team defending networks? I said, that sounds awesome. So. You can actually move from, it doesn't matter where you start, you can move into this field. And that's really what we wanted this panel to be about, is people like us who haven't been into the computer since they were eight years old and haven't been working toward this, but you can still get places in the information security field without a background in engineering. All right, let's see. What most prepared you to work in InfoSec? You wanna start with that one, Susan? Sure. So. Um I have a degree in economics, incredibly useful, uh, really only useful if you want to be a college professor and you go on and get a PhD. Uh, but I did take some computer science classes a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and I think that actually was helpful, not because I wanted to write code, but I understood the process. Um, and I had a number of jobs before I ever got into anything involved in software, but I came to information security by chance, I was working managing product releases at EMC and a customer reported a vulnerability. And I ended up having to work with our product security organization to help get that through the process, manage the fix, manage the communications, and deal with the customer. And I was very engaged with the folks who were working in product security. I was interested in what they were doing, built a relationship, and then when they had an opportunity, they asked me to come and join them, and that was 12-ish or so years ago, so I almost like restarted my career with that and went in a completely different direction. Um, I, this is a weird question because I don't think any pre anything prepared me to work in InfoSec, um, to be honest, uh, but I, I think understanding how business, businesses run is important because um, a lot of people, all of the companies I had worked at before, I mean, I the first company I worked at out of college, I don't even know if we had a security team. Like it was just something that I know we had an IT department that you know the guy I called when like my computer wouldn't start, but security was not on my radar at all. So um, I think understanding how a business works and the relationship between IT and security um, is a good prep. Um, kind of understanding that. And then I think just being somewhat tech savvy, like understanding how the internet came to be and like how computers generally work. Um, I know that sounds like very simple, but um, like when I started my first job at SSH, I didn't know what a server was um, and like a client server and I was like, what? Um, so I think understanding just the basics of, and not necessarily like, taking a computer science class, but just understanding um, technology. So what most prepared me to work in InfoSec, I think, was actually working on submarine systems. Uh, if any of you are familiar with submarines, uh, they, much like the internet, are a series of tubes. So, um, <laughs> but seriously, uh, submarines are a, uh, a incredibly complex uh, pile of machinery that nobody totally understands, and I like to think of computers in the same way. Uh, they're both sort of uh, something that you have to take apart piece by piece and start to specialize in. And information security is a lot in the same way. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, and the only way to really take it all in and deal with it is to just take it piece by piece and try to adapt to it as it comes to you. So I have a slightly different take. So I, working on the sales side, um, you know, I have to really be uh, engaged in many of the business processes and really any project that's sold from, from start to finish. So I would say looking back, what prepared me the most is the years I spent in food service dealing with, you know, 
upset customers, especially when I went through the manager training at Applebee's. Um, you know, they spent a lot of time in emphasis uh, teaching us how to diffuse situations. You know, if somebody has an undercooked meal, how do you handle that, right? So my role as a client director in helping our clients navigate various different projects, you know, as we know, no project ever goes smoothly as, as planned, right? There's always uh, setbacks and twists and turns. So really, what's prepared me the most is, is really learning how to diffuse those situations and help steer it from a negative experience into more of a positive experience. Um, and I think that's really lent to a lot of the success, so. How about Jordan? What do you wish you were more prepared for or more prepared about when you started your job in InfoSec two months ago? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I have to admit, when I came in, I, uh, I thought I was super knowledgeable about computers. I had uh, you know, played with them for years, taken them apart, put, in, put them back together. Uh, but when I came in, what I realized was that uh, no matter how much you think you know, there's always more to know. So. When I got into information security, the first thing that really baffled me was uh, Python. Um, I had some experience in C++ beforehand, but uh, it was not nearly enough to help me understand the uh, you know, complex scripting tools that a lot of the penetration testing team uses. Uh, so beforehand, I really wish that I had just sort of, uh, I guess, tried to get that same mindset that a programmer has when they uh, try to yeah, create a piece of software uh, to accomplish a task. Uh, having that sort of ability to break things down into individual processes and sort of put it all together to work is uh, something I'm still working on developing today. And if I can also tell a little story about Jordan, he and I actually work together. Uh, we both work at Rapid7, and at Rapid7 we have a team of about 25, 30 or so pen testers. and. I, I know a, a lot of pen testers, and there's brilliant pen testers all around the world. And on our team, we also have some really smart guys. And w when Jordan was hired, one of the very, probably not the first thing, but one of the first things he got sent to do was to come to this thing that we call Hackathon. And Hackathon is when we get most of our pen testing team together in a building, and we kind of just all work together. And you can imagine my head spins when I look at some of these other guys on my team and some of the stuff they know. And here's Jordan starting his job, first job at InfoSec, walking into a room of 20 or 30 pen testers with the IT and the hacking and all that kind of stuff flying around. And then to make it even more badass by him, on Wednesday night of Hackathon, we have what we call our mini-con, where everybody's encouraged to kind of present on something for about 10 minutes, and everybody's up there showing this new hack, this different hack that they're gonna do. He just signed right up and he's up there giving a presentation with everybody else and I thought it was one of the most valuable ones that anybody on the team gave and he's just like, I'm one of you guys, I'm right here with you. So that was one of Jordan's kind of badass moments, I think, with starting in InfoSec. Thank you. Rachel. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I think uh, going is my first job and looking back at that and what I know now, I think the most alarming thing um, I'm sure this applies to other industries, but how big the space is and how many different types of products and platforms and solutions and technology there is out there, and just trying to understand um, how those, each of those apply to how a business runs and what a CISO thinks of when he's building out his stack, you know, understanding why they think AV is necessary, why they think firewall is necessary, and what type of um, solutions are necessary, and understanding SIM and how where that sits and how that fits into everything else that's happening, and DLP and incident response, and just really understanding, like from a business mind, when uh, someone is building out their security stack, all the things that they need in order to keep the business safe. Um, and going into my first job, it was an encryption company and we did like a uh, key, you know, SSH key management. And I think of like encryption and SSH, SSH keys and stuff as like a tiny little part of like the entire landscape now. Um, and so, you know, reading more about that and trying to talk to CISOs or security analysts or whoever it may be um, to kind of understand the, the business side of, of, of a security stack in that entire space. Susan. 
So I actually will pick up where you left off on, off on that, because I think understanding that the interaction of security and business is incredibly important. And I was not newly working when I came to InfoSec. I had experience in the world of software, but what I wasn't prepared for was how difficult it was to make security a priority. And so that's where you have to be able to engage with the business people to educate them, not harangue them, and help them understand why it has to be a priority. Because often it's not, even today, surprisingly, it's not. So being able to speak in business terms about something you know, somewhat technical, you don't have to go too deep, but be able to present facts and figure, figures and help lay out the risks that the business will understand so they understand why they have to make it a priority. Um, that was a, a hard lesson to learn and I, that's still part of my job every day today and it, it can be a battle every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, trying to help you know, our CISOs and the, you know, the board of directors and the very C-levels and the clients we work with uh, take what the outputs of these different technologies are giving and tying that back to business works is very challenging. So, you know, whenever I came into the industry, you know, it was much different than it is today. But for me, it was relatively easy to pick up, okay, a firewall does this, a, you know, DLP does that, you know, the actual functionality of the spectrum of technology that's out there. But for me, what would have been very helpful back then as a, as a young person coming in is learning how each of those technologies interplay with policies, procedures, standards, what does compliance have to do with that, right? What are some of the external factors that are forcing the businesses to make decisions that aren't necessarily based in either a technology or a functionality? So, uh, and then again, that's, that's one of those areas that's still kind of always evolving and I'm always trying to stay in front of, but I think that would have been the most helpful. If somebody would have set me down and said, okay, here's technology, but here it out all works with the business. Um, that took me a long time to just kind of figure out on my own. I'll throw this out to anybody that wants to jump at it. Uh, when somebody doesn't really have a technical background and they're moving into something like InfoSec, which is a technical field, it can probably be a little bit scary, like I'm gonna be intimidated by all those engineers and tech people. How much of that do you think is a real concern and how much of that do you think you probably, how, how much tech do you think you should know, especially if you're not exactly in an engineering kind of role? I'll take that one to start. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not technical. My wife actually jokes that she's the help desk of our house. You know, I can't even figure out how to work more, you know, the iPad half the time, right? So, but when it comes to understanding the basic functionality of the various technologies out there, I do understand that because I've been living in it for 10 years. You know, I see it every day. So, you know, I think, I think it's okay to not be the subject matter expert in everything, but as long as you know the basics of how something operates or how a technology operates or how maybe two technologies you know, interplay against one another. Um, you know, I think to, to come in and not have that expertise is okay. You don't need to be the expert, but as long as you have a basic understanding, I think that that's at least a start. And to add on to that, um, having a sense of curiosity and being willing to ask questions is important and also having a little bit of humility. So I've, I'm a, I have a pretty good technical understanding. I'm not a hands-on technician and haven't ever been in my career, but I work with some incredibly smart people and they like to teach and they like to share. And as long as you're willing to be honest about what you know and you don't know and you don't try and act like something you're not, um, people are gonna respect the fact that you wanna learn and you wanna grow. And as a, most of my career, I've been a program manager, which means I'm responsible for coordinating a lot of people to solve problems and deliver things. So I have to know the right questions to ask. But generally what I do is find out what kind of skills are needed and I find those experts and I bring them in and I get out of the way. So you just have to be willing to understand the context and then bring in the experts and then have an opportunity to let them be the experts and then learn from them. Yeah, I think Susan hit it on the head in terms of being okay to ask questions. And I'm, I know there are probably jerks in every industry, but there are going to be still some of the engineers and some of the technical people that are more than happy to explain things. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, how does this kind of thing work? Or in your report this week, it, you, you talked about this. How exactly can you just, my own interest, I want to learn how this kind of thing works. Do you mind explaining that to me? I'd love to. 
sure, go ahead and ask these people, especially at a conference like this where you heard Jack earlier talking about it's all about community, it's all about communication, talking to people. And if you have these kind of interests, even if you don't have the background, even if it's not part of your job, but you want to learn and you're curious, ask. People love to talk about this kind of stuff. It's often a whole lot of fun. What tips would you give someone else that doesn't have an engineering background that wants to get in? Then maybe they have some other kind of background currently and they think this information security thing seems like it's going to be a big deal someday. I want to get into it. Let's see. Rachel, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think the most helpful things for me starting um, when I first started out and still to this day are, um, I mean, there's so many, like going to events, like if you're here right now, like that's a great start. Um, B-sides and like the, the like show me cons and the HUSEC cons and like all of those little hacker cons are incredibly helpful, uh, attending all of those sessions and panels. Um, I think reading about security um, in the mainstream news is helpful in a way, but also making sure that you're reading like Krebs um, and uh, you know, whatever your, your flavor is, dark reading, whatever it may be. Um, but listening to people and uh, how they talk about security and, um, and I don't know, like everyone might not have an opportunity to like work in like a trade show booth at, someday, um, but I've worked in many trade show booths um, for different companies at like Black Hat and RSA and SANS events and people coming up to the booth and you know, what do you guys do? You give them your spiel, but then hearing the kinds of questions that they ask, like what immediately comes to their mind, what's important to them, um, going back to the business case thing, is probably the um, most insightful um, experiences I've had um, and has helped me, um, I think, do my job better, is actually speaking to people that are subject matter, matter experts and figuring out what's on their mind. And if you aren't at a trade show, then um, obviously there's tons of reading materials and tons and tons of blogs. Swift on security, you know, always a good place. Uh, yeah. So the other thing to keep in mind is you can work in information security without being a security engineer or a software engineer or a hardware engineer or a pen tester. Um, I work at a security company, but it's still a company and it has lots of jobs that are not about being an engineer. Marketing people get to be intertwined with security. They need to understand it and be able to communicate it about it, but they love marketing, so they do marketing. We still have finance people. Uh, you know, so you can be involved in the industry without being an engineer. So it's figure out what you like to do and then if it's not an, an engineering function, but you're interested in security, find a company that's looking for the stuff that you like to do in the corporate world, and then you can be involved, and then you can learn more, and if you wanna take another path once you get in, most companies are willing to let you learn and have opportunities to try stuff out. Yeah, so I, I think you know, what they both said is, is very relevant, and I think too, uh, coming in, you, know, you have to be humble, right? As has been said before, but you have to be okay with asking questions. And I think most importantly, you have to be okay when somebody asks you something and you don't know the answer, to say, hey, I don't know the answer to that. That's okay not to know. I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff out there to, to really understand and, and learn. So, um, you know, as a young sales rep starting, you know, there were several times where I tried to kind of BS my way through answers or whatever, and, and it always ended poorly. So, you know, I learned that very quickly that uh, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to say, hey, I don't know, but I do know where I can get that answer for you. Um, and two, coming from the sales side, you know, kind of to echo what Susan was saying, there's lots of in entry-level sales jobs, whether that's working in lead generation or, you know, just an entry-level inside sales role, where that really gives you a lot of experience and uh, exposure to, you know, whether that's a specific technology or a services business or whatever. So I think that that might be a really good foot in the door. And then, you know, you can go in there and pivot, and if you like what you do or you see something that you really want to, uh, you're interested in, you know, start focusing on that after you have a couple years of kind of industry experience under your belt. I actually have a really good example of a colleague who, uh, uh, who's actually about to become an ex-colleague because he's moving on. He was selling insurance uh, three years ago. He came to Veracode uh, in a entry-level sales, like lead generation or something, some kind of role like that. Did that for less than a year came over to program management and learned about program management, was an associate for less than a year, 
moved into product management because he wanted to learn about how products get developed. And that was his ultimate goal. He was in product management for a year, and he just took a much bigger role in product management at another company. So from insurance to software security product management in under three years. Jordan, are there any tips that today you'd give yourself two months ago? <laughs> um, honestly, I think uh, one of the most important things that you can sort of show in the industry and one of the most important tools you can have is just a baseline interest. Um, if you're here, you're probably interested in security, at least I hope you are. Um, but if you can show in an interview or you can show when you're talking to somebody in the industry that it's something you really care about or something that really sort of uh, makes your mind work, um, I think that's really important. And then as a result of that in interest, those uh, you know, important questions that you'll have to ask will come naturally to you. Um, you know, you'll, you'll feel more inclined to approach those people and uh, figure things out when uh, you know, security is something that you really care about, uh, no matter what the reason is behind that. So, passion. Exactly. The uh, dreaded word. <laughs> um, and I have another example kind of to go off of yours, someone who's actually here, and I told her, I was like, I'm probably going to use that as an example. Um, but someone I really look up to, um, who's really like paved her own path, she started off in PR, um, working for an agency, and then came in-house um, for one of her clients, which was core security. She's sneezing right now. Um, and she was just our, you know, she was our PR and social media person, but she would spend so many hours sitting with our security team and our technical team, product team, Try, she would write our blog um, and just getting as much information as she could. She was, is, luckily she's very smart too. Um, but what, three, four years later, now she's on the security team at Rapid7. Um, so it's uh, Katie Ledoux. <laughs> yes, I embarrassed her. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right, so how about, did you intend to work in InfoSec, or did you fall into it, and how? You want to go first, Nick? Sure, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I had no intention of going into InfoSec. Um, I actually had some friends uh, that worked at the company I started with, so Fishnet Security was a predecessor company to Optiv, and um, it was based in Kansas City, which is where I'm from. The, the manager gig was a, a grind. You know, I was working like eight hours a week, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, really, and... I had a couple of buddies that were inside sales. Hey, come check it out. So I started looking into them. Like, you know what? This is this is maybe really interesting, right? And you know, now I've relocated my family to the East Coast a while ago and, and made a very nice career out of it. So uh, I didn't intend on doing it, but very happy that I landed here for sure. Yeah, I, I can sort of uh, concur with that. Uh, I I definitely didn't intend information security. Uh, I knew I was interested in tech, but um, as far as uh, I guess falling into it, uh, it was a very, you know, I guess regular process. I just, I sort of applied for jobs. I, I got a interview with Rapid7, and as soon as I interviewed at the company, that's when I knew I wanted to work there because there were so many of those questions that I wanted to ask in the interview. It was a two-hour long interview, and I feel like that wasn't enough time. So, uh, again, the that interest, those questions that you'll ask, are, I think are integral in uh, sort of falling into the industry. Um, yeah, no intention at all. I moved to Boston six years ago, um, and I had been working in the world for two years and luckily had a foundation of marketing knowledge. So um, signed up with like a temp agency, and uh, three weeks after moving to Boston, they threw me into this company called SSH Communication Security, and basically as a uh, temporary position to work as a marketing coordinator to help with trade shows and emails and um, just general marketing stuff that I had some ability in. And I went to my first like security conference, I think it was like InfoSec in Orlando, Florida, and um, I was like hooked after that because I like walked into the trade show floor and I was like, what are all these people? And I was, <laughs> I didn't know what any of the companies did. And um, it was so interesting. I would just spend the day like walking around. And, I mean, I worked, I was like in the booth, but you know, on my breaks, I would like walk around and like, you would like check out all the messaging and like go and talk to uh, different vendors about what they did. And um, 
And then after that, I started noticing, like I would start actually um, noticing stories about data breaches in the news, because like before I was like, I don't care. Um, but then I started getting very interested in that. So it, um, and then two companies later, I'm still in it, and I plan to be in cybersecurity for hopefully um, the rest of my career, because I think it's the most um, important industry out there. <laughs> but security conferences do have the best swag, though. Yeah, they have pretty good swag. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So I didn't have the intent to work in it because I've been working long enough that it didn't exist when I started working. Um, so I didn't work in anything technical for the first couple of jobs, and then uh, I got into software project management. And um, I think I talked about this a little bit already. I spent many years doing that and when one of the products that was in my portfolio to manage had a vulnerability I got very interested in the process of finding it and remediating it and resolving it and the process that went along with all of that and was lucky enough to be offered an opportunity to move in that direction just because just by happenstance so um, it was, I guess we make it four out of four, not, or five out of five. None yeah, absolutely. Of, none of us intended to do this and look at where we are. Because I can relate to what Susan said, it didn't exist way, anyway. Next question. <laughs> uh, what skills do you think are important to you being successful in your job? Susan, oh, you're still thinking, so, I, George? Uh, so uh, I think this applies to any job, ability to, Listen and communicate effectively is important to any role because unless you are sitting in a room by yourself, working for yourself, and never dealing with another human being, generally every problem that I see happen is not because a product fails or because somebody didn't do their job or somebody intended to do something harmful. It comes with missed expectations and miscommunication so being able to communicate effectively in both in person or communicating verbally as well as in writing. And um, that's actually becoming more of a challenge these days and I apologize for being generational, but people who are used to typing you know, a couple characters in a text and abbreviating things, having good writing skills and being able to address a professional email effectively stands out so much it seems very basic, but those are things that get noticed. I think you just made Jordan's day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you did. <laughs> um, so uh, for my job specifically, so I'm a marketing manager. Um, I have a very difficult job, um, along with salespeople, because selling and marketing to info security people is challenging because they are like no BS people. They will see right through you. You can't like do the like HubSpotty like 10 things that will clean up your security environment and like <laughs> and like they'll, they'll be like no. So um, for me um, going off uh, uh, what Susan was saying, um, having good interpersonal skills and being able to be open to asking questions and learning more and general curiosity and understanding that you do not know best, you need to go to the people that know best. Fortunately for me, I am surrounded by the people that I try and market and sell to. So we have a security operations center in our office. Um, I go in there numerous times a day. Uh, one of our SOC members is here and I'll go in and I'll be like, can you read this? What do you think? about this, like what would you think if you got this in the mail from us? And it's incredibly helpful. I mean, they're sometimes too honest. Um, they'll be like, that's so stupid. And um, <laughs> like I wanted to like be like, oh, like maybe we should do like a giveaway, like a Nest camera. And they were like, are you kidding me? You can't give like security people cameras. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, good point. Um, so it's really um, helpful to be surrounded by the people that I'm trying to market and sell to. And it's really just um, being humble and not trying to like trick them because they will see right through you. Um, yeah, and scene. Yeah, I worked for a company once that gave away USB keys at a- Oh yeah, uh, that's at, another one. That probably shouldn't give away. <laughs> Here's the USB. Um, so, 
take it from the tech writer, uh, attention to detail is important in almost any job field, I think, but especially in information security. Um, whether it be, uh, you know, actually testing vulnerabilities or reporting them, uh, everything hinges on, uh, you know, very minor inconsistencies or, uh, you know, areas where uh, you sort of have to go in with a microscope to really find uh, what's wrong with something. Um, so being able to, to look at something critically and sort of break it down into pieces and uh, I guess digress in a productive way is uh, very important when it, it comes to this field. And I'd also like to point out that uh, being disruptive, uh, finding ways to innovate is really something that uh, is helpful not only uh, when you're trying to get into the field, but once you're in it as well, because uh, this is a field that's constantly evolving, and it's a field that needs people to, uh, you know, come up with new ideas, new processes for things, uh, just new ways of doing stuff, because uh, if we don't come up with things, uh, new things to do, uh, we'll eventually stagnate and fall behind uh, whoever the competition might be. So being the last one to respond, this afforded me the luxury to think about this for a minute. So there's several skills that I think are very important to my job, again, tempered through a sales lens, right? So the first one is be relevant. And what do I mean by that? So, you know, I'm constantly emailing and calling CISOs, CIOs, senior directors, CTOs, you know, across organizations that I'm prospecting into. And I always try to put myself into their shoes and think about how many emails that they get in a day, hundreds if not thousands, right? Half of them are from guys like me trying to get a, you know, a meeting or a follow-up or whatever. So, um, you know, I found to be very successful, and now I apply this everywhere, but be relevant and to the point. I never send an email, especially an introductory email or an unsolicited email, more than about two or three sentences. Um, you know, if, if you don't have somebody's attention within the first couple words, you're in the, you're in the, the, the trash box. So uh, be relevant and be concise. Um, another very important skill, to, to Susan's point, is communication skills, specifically the ability to listen. Um, and I'll give a, a kind of an anecdotal uh, example. So just about a month ago, I was attending the um, Boston Secure World Conference down in, at the Heinz Center. And uh, I observed kind of from a, from a side uh, an interaction between a sales rep and then a individual from a very large organization based in Boston that everybody in this room would recognize their name. Uh, so the, this, the person from this company came up and started asking questions. Sales rep got real excited because they saw the big name. He's like, oh, wow, we're going to really impress this guy. And he started just talking and talking and talking. The person from the customer was trying to interject. He was trying to share his problems. He was asking questions, but the sales rep was just going, going, going. He wasn't even taking one second to listen to this guy. So. A few minutes went by, the guy kind of threw up his hands and walked away, right? And uh, I think that that sales rep, had they just taken a minute to stop and listen and really hear and understand what this, you know, fairly high ranking person from this company was trying to say, he most definitely would have at least led to a follow-up meeting, if not a sale. But now, you know, good luck selling to that guy anytime in the next couple of years. So uh, listening is very, very important. Communication skills, for sure. Yeah, and that's awesome. And I would add on to that, and this, you guys can throw tomatoes at me if you want, because I'm going to throw out a very fuzzy one, but situational awareness. So that's a perfect example of the person had their own agenda, the salesperson there had their own agenda, and rather than opening themselves up to what someone was wanting to bring to them to ask for their help on, he was just doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to read the un spoken messages, pay attention to the dynamics of the people in the room. One of the, one of the best things somebody ever told me is, the, especially now with, where everybody has maybe three devices sometimes they're carrying, especially if you're trying to get somebody on your side or pitch something or get a project approved or get funding for something, the moment one of the decision makers picks up their device, you've lost them. So you have to keep them engaged. And sometimes you can get them back, but paying attention to the nonverbal cues that are going on in the room, and sometimes other people in whatever situation you're in are communicating between themselves nonverbally. And so 
it, it, it's not an easy skill to develop and it's not innate in everybody, but it's really, really important. Cool. I thought this, let's see. That's the last question that I have might be just kind of fun. What's something technical you've learned on the job that you didn't know when you started? Hmm. I'm gonna go first because I feel like I don't want anyone to take mine. Um, <laughs> I thought about this before. Luckily, I saw this answer. Um, I mean, question. So, um, I mean, there's tons of stuff that I've learned, like learning that like people can hack your like camera on your laptop and like little stuff, like all the different types of IoT things that can be hacked. So that's all like very interesting um, and scary to learn about. Um, but something uh, pretty scary is the is fileless malware. Um, and when I first heard that, I had no idea what that meant. Um, but I think learning about uh, like utilizing PowerShell and WMI um, to basically control an OS without actually installing any software um, is pretty trippy. Trippy was the word. <laughs> um, I would say probably one of the coolest things I've gotten to do has nothing to do with any work that I've done, but I showed an interest in something and a previous employer was kind enough to fund me to take a digital forensics class. And that was pretty darn cool. And it was a struggle for me because it was highly technical, but I had a colleague who helped me through it and I learned a ton and I learned some really scary stuff. So I guess the thing that I wanted to point out is not really uh, pertinent to cybersecurity per se, but uh, at the hackathon, Patrick mentioned uh, one of the consultants actually taught me how to pick a lock, which I thought was oh, yeah. very interesting. It's, it's a lot of fun, and it, it's actually a lot like uh, hacking in sort of a uh, high level sense. It's breaking something down into pieces, uh, identifying the safeties, and then bypassing them one by one. So I've learned a tremendous amount of technical, you know, information that I didn't know coming into it, but some of the things that really stand out, um, you know, not that long ago I participated in a, um, a presentation of findings where we did a very large corporate-wide penetration test for a, a Fortune 100 company. And, um, you know, it was a several month effort with multiple resources and across the world doing all sorts of uh, pen testing. And it ranged from, you know, app scanning all the way down to social engineering and, you know, physical security penetration testing. So uh, to see the, the results of that, um, you know, the ways that these guys were actually able to gain entrance into secured buildings and go around and just the, the information, you know, whether that be printed files or just open ports or conference rooms with a you know, computer in it that's unlocked. You know, this you know, large Fortune 100, highly regulated, secure company was just astounding, the way that, the way that, that our, our you know, ethical hackers were able to go in and do that uh, really blew me away. I mean, it, it was, and this was only a few months ago that, that you know, I set in on this, so uh, very cool to see the way that they do that. I mean, just as a side note, we have one guy crawling through ductwork to try to get into somebody's data center one time, and he fell through the ceiling. <laughs> So, you know, the, the, the extent that, you know, not only our guys will do, but also the bad guys will do to go in and get somewhere is just uh, really, really very revealing, so. So we probably have time for one question-ish from the audience. Does anybody think of one while we were going through this? That they want either the whole panel or one person to answer? So, um I'm in more of a technical role myself, more of an engineer, but uh, kind of just curious, is there anything, feedback you guys could give, I guess, to more technical people, or like criticisms or tips, I guess, to help you guys be more effective in your job? I don't know if I've ever told an engineer what to do. Um, <laughs> Here's your chance. So, uh, I, I, just keep, uh, helping everyone else out in, um, in like the information sharing uh, manner. And I think, like I said, attending meetups and B-sides and hacker cons and uh, capture the flag type things, um, networking, I think, uh, I mean, I can't help you in any way, um, but like, 
probably like other people here can, but just like saying hello. Maybe patience with those of us who are less technical than mm -hmm. you, yeah. especially those who are expressing interest and curiosity and want to learn and might things need things explained to them more than once. So um, people aren't trying to bother you. They generally really want your help. Are there any others? Do your companies formally encourage uh, additional ed education or certifications? The short answer is yes. <laughs> I don't think certifications as much, um, but I could be wrong. Mike, <coughs> certification? Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, I mean, we sponsor a lot of uh, kind of information sharing gatherings um, and meetups because that's very important. Um, I mean, I feel like that's uh, how security has evolved, is from everyone sharing knowledge about, look at this piece of malware I found and look at this thing that I discovered and um, sharing research and uh, so I think it's very important. Yeah, and that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of certifications that are not necessarily engineering oriented. There's CISSPs and GSACs and GIA, uh, GIAC or Certified Ethical Hacker and that kind of stuff. But um, there's other organizations that offer other more um, process and program level and management types of certifications that are still around this. ISACA is one, Certified Inf Information Security Manager, Certified Information Risk something, C-Risk, um, uh, CISA, I don't even know what the acronyms are, but ISACA is a great one where you can be in the area of information assurance and information security, but you don't have to be a hands-on engineer. I'm working on my CISM right now, and my company is sponsoring me for that. I got another, I got a third-party risk management certification, and they sponsored me for that. Um, and so, yeah, definitely. Yeah, one of the things that Opta does is also sponsor anybody interested in doing their CISSP or any of those others, but uh, one of the lines of business that we, we have is around training. So we do a bunch of security awareness training, and you know, hacker training and coding training, but we also have a, a pr pretty large uh, course book of technical training, whether that's, uh, you know, be certified to be a F5 LTM administrator or, a, you know, firewall admin expert or whatever. There's a bunch of different classes. And so they'll actually, you kind of have to ask for it, but they'll actually let our employees sit in on those classes if we don't have a full session, as long as it's convenient for their workload and their manager approves it. So, um, you know, so that gives them exposure if somebody wants to go learn more about a specific technology or whatever, so. Always continuing education, that's for sure. I want to thank the panel for, for doing this. And thank all of you for coming. And I'm guessing if you catch one of them out in the hallway and you get questions for them, they'd probably be happy to answer that. And